All right, and uh, last few slides. So this was all for, or, or uh, yeah, this is about uniformity of a gamma camera. And as I said, it, if all goes well, it should be nice and uniform. In a PET camera, that's very different. So here is a PET camera image. All is going well, and it's not uniform at all. And the reason is that the PET is pixelated and that the performance of these pixels is position dependent. So um, this is for the HIRES, which is a system by Siemens and different from GE and maybe Philips. I don't know what Philips does. The uh, sinogram of Siemens models not only the crystals, but also little gaps between the crystals. So if you position detectors on a ring, it's impossible to put them so close together that there are no gaps at all. So there are always little spaces between neighboring uh, detector blocks. And Siemens just designed them to have exactly the same size as the crystals. So that ensures that in a nice uh, uniformly sampled sinogram, the gaps only eliminate one pin. And here you can see that. So this is a sinogram. And here, um, so horizontal is the position of the line of response and vertical is the angle. And if you take uh, a cross section here, the sinogram is a 3D block. I will show more of that uh, later. If you take a 3D projection uh, uh, line here, you get this image and you can think of that as um, a parallel projection made by the PET camera of a uniform source. Right, so we have a big uniform plane, which is in the gamma camera. And this is what a parallel projection would look like. So you see all these gaps. There's nothing to do about the gaps. They are. Um, missing detectors, so you can never measure anything. So these white lines cannot be destroyed. You also see that there are gray lines. That's um, also due to gaps and to the complicated sampling that seems is doing. I'm not sure I should be explaining that here, but as a result of that, it results in a decrease of the sensitivity of some uh, projection lines, but not zeroing them. And you see that here in, uh, in the sinogram. So this is the sensitivity sinogram. This is a measurement. So you see the noise. And here you also see the reduced uh, sensitivity. So this thing is made from a very long measurement and using uh, a model of, of the PET camera. And that allows uh, uh, the software to eliminate almost all of the noise. So we know this is a sensitivity. This is a measurement of a cylinder. So we can correct this one for this sensitivity. And then we get that one. And now you see that this actual sensitivity has been uh, drop has been eliminated. So we can correct for that. But of course, we cannot correct for the gaps. So the gaps are still there. So this is a uniform image that's as good as we can get it. OK, then uh, yeah, already the time was mentioned before. So here is a bit on the time. Um, and one way to explain the problem is, is uh, suppose that you put a huge amount of activity in front of a gamma camera, for example, but the same is true for a PET camera. And uh, it produces, for example, 500,000 counts per second. And we measure uh, what the gamma camera measures, then we would give this value. And then we expect if you would wait for that activity to de decay, um, you would expect a straight line to the origin, right? Because if it decays to half of the activity, you would expect that the gamma camera also see half of the counts. But it doesn't, it, see, it sees a bit more than half. And so instead of a nice straight line, you get this curved line. Now it's that time, meaning if the gamma camera sees too many photons, it doesn't function as well. So actually it's correct performance is all the way down here. So we should, an even better way to think about it is of an increasing activity, but that's much more difficult to organize. And so if you would increase the activity all the time, then in the beginning, the gamma camera would nicely keep up. You double the activity and the gamma camera says, I see twice the activity, but if you go higher and higher, it starts uh, having a problem counting. And the reason is that every now and then two photons will arrive at the same time. Their energy will be added and the energy window will decide that this photon needs to be rejected because it doesn't have the right energy. Okay. So now there is two ways that this can happen. One can be 
well, what I just said, what I just said is front end uh, dead time. It's because the scintillator itself has a problem with it. But suppose we have a very good scintillator, then we need very good electronics to keep up with all that information. So it's also possible to saturate the electronics. The scintillation works fine and the front end electronics works fine, but somewhere in the chain, uh, there is a maximum frequency, then counts will be lost because the memory is simply not fast enough to store. All right. So here are two very simple models to model uh, those effects. So we can say, suppose that um, there is um, R0 photons coming in. So that would be the true count rate. Now we want the, the probability that in a small interval tau, um, only one or no other photon arrives, right? So we, we have measured this photon and now we say, okay, for a time tau, we don't want to see another photon because if we see one, they will combine and um, then their energies will be added. So we can compute the probability to see um, no photons if we expect R0 tau one photons. And so you, the solution to that is you take the Poisson equation, you say the expectation is R0 to one, and what we want to see is no photons and we compute the probability for that to happen. And then you will simplify that this is E minus the expectation. So that means, uh, so yeah, so this tau one is a, a small time during which we don't want to see anything else. And that means that if, um, R0 is low, then this is almost zero, and R1 is almost equal to R0, which is what is happening here. And as soon as this R0 starts to become large compared to the, uh, um, yeah, the time to the, to the response time, if you wish, of the, of the, or the integration time of the, of the system, uh, then we start having this problem, right? So typically this tau one equals, uh, I think twice the um, acceptance we know basically, because we don't want the scintillation just before the photon comes in and we don't want the scintillation immediately after it. So, all right, but now, so R1 is the number of photons going to the electronics, right? So that is here. And R2 is the number of photons coming out here of the electronics. And ideally, of course, R2 should be equal to R1. But it is possible that um, the electronics is incapable of processing uh, more than a particular number of photons. So we can compute how much uh, time of the computer is still available if it has to process R2 photons. So suppose tau 2 is the time it takes to process a single event then every second uh, it needs to uh, process R2 times T2 uh, events. So this is the fraction of the time that the system is counting. And if we subtract that from minus from one, then we get the, the probability that a count will make it through. So again, if this R2 is, uh, or I can say the other way. So if you compute this, if you compute R2 from this, you get this expression. So basically it says that if R1 is small or if, tau, if R1 is small compared to tau two, then that means that the system is actually always ready to accept uh, photons and then R2 equals R1. Suppose that R1 is very, very, very large, then this thing equals one over tau two. And one over tau two is the number of uh, processing, single photon processing times in a second. So that means it just achieves the maximum count rate. If the thing can process 100,000 photons per second and you give it a million, it will process 100,000. So it's not going to be parallelized. It's going to do the best it can. And has in this case to throw away 900,000 because it simply cannot store them quick enough. So that means that this front-end electronic, they call it parallelizable. So for example, in a PET scanner, if you turn on the CT next to it, then the PET gets parallelized. It sees so many photons from that CT that it is basically dead all the time. 
because it never happens that a pet coincidence pair is detected nicely, isolated in time. There will always be other photons coming in. So that means R1 is actually zero if R, R2 gets huge. This one is not parallelizable. It just converts to a maximum, and when it reaches a maximum, that's all it is. All right. But if you do, um, if R0 is relatively small and you do a first order uh, uh, Taylor series expansion, then you see that these two expressions become identical. So uh, correction software by the vendors will typically uh, use something like that to correct this. But if you go very high, then the behavior will be different. It will be a mixture of the two. But the idea is don't go very high because you don't want to be here. You don't want to inject a huge amount of activity in a patient and then not count a lot of the photons. That, that is almost criminal. Then you should in, inject less and make sure that what you inject is counted at least. So you want to stay away here. It's also bad for quantification, bad for images, bad for the technologies. So you want to operate. But still, it can happen. For example, if you do a dynamic scan and you do a bolus injection, meaning that you quickly inject all the activity uh, in, in uh, in the vein of the patient and all that activity may uh, will arrive almost simultaneously in the heart and if you're then imaging the heart then you see a huge dose in the heart and even a good system may uh, suffer some dead time mm -hmm. so in principle it's corrected uh, but the correction will break down if you go very high but that should be avoided the current systems are pretty fast so it should probably not be a problem all right, and then uh, this is the final slide of the session. So this is about randoms correction in PET. And so, uh, in, yeah, as you know, in PET, we have problems with randoms and we have problems with scatters. And this is to explain that scatters is still a pain, but randoms can be estimated pretty accurately. They contribute noise, but their effect on the bias is negligible. So we can correct them very, very well. And here is an explanation of the, the basic idea. So we have a detector. So this is, this is a, to measure a prompt. So this can be a true or a random. Um, this detector sees a photo. And then the system checks if within the time window, another detector has seen something too. And this detector says, yeah, I saw something too. And then, yeah, you see this fits in the time window. So the, the pet camera will, will decide that there is a relation, uh, that these two are related and that that is a coincident event. But of course, it could be that this one is a single and this is another single which happens to enter in this um, same time window and then we have a random. Now to estimate how often that happens, you can slightly shift this window. It doesn't need to be much, like a, a microsecond would largely be enough. And now we do the same thing. So. Uh, we use exactly the same electronics, everything the same, and we tell the PET camera, this one detects something here. Check if you see something in a shifted window. And uh, in a microsecond, nothing much will happen in a patient. So this again may happen, but this time it has to be a single because the probability that one of the photons will hang around a microsecond and then get detected is zero, of course. And the argument that this works is that the probability for this to happen is identical to the probability for this to happen. And that is almost true. <clears throat> and in practice, it works extremely well. Um, it is not 100% true. And the reason is that um, this could actually be, uh, wait, um, this could have been part of a true. Yeah, so this may not have been a single, but it could have been a true. And this may also not have been a single, could also happen. So suppose you put a, a point source exactly in the middle of a pet camera and everything is fine, then you should see no signals because the if one photon gets detected for symmetry, the other one should be detected. So this is an ideal pet camera. We assume it has perfect stopping power, right? So in this perfect pet system, you would have no signals only trues and no scatters because there is nothing to scatter. Yet in this system, we would also have every now and then a random here and here. 
or a detection here and another detection in the shifted window, but that because this is true, it's not a signal. So you should actually correct for the signals that are half truths, <coughs> which is typically not known. But the contribution of coincidences to randoms is very, very small compared to the contribution of signals to randoms. Um, so we have been looking at that because at some time for our research, we thought that there might be an error in the random estimate, but as far as I know, currently we're happy with the random estimate by company. So this is how they was originally done. And uh, you can smooth this a bit because randoms tend to be smooth, but um, the model has been sophisticated a lot by exploiting the fact that we know that these randoms are combinations of singles. And, uh, that means if you know the number of singles in every detector, then in principle, you can compute the number of randoms. But the number of singles in every detector, that's just a small number of parameters because we don't have that many detectors. The number of randoms along every line is a huge number of parameters because we got a huge amount of LORs. So modeling it as a combination of singles is a very powerful parameter reduction. So requiring that this measurement can be explained as a combination of singles does away with a huge amount of noise. So basically, we can have a noise-free estimate of the randoms, and in practice, it is unbiased. So that means you still don't like randoms because the randoms will add Poisson noise, and then you subtract their mean, but the Poisson noise contribution stays there, of course. So you don't like them, but they will not ruin quantification. They will just add noise. Scatter is different. Scatter will also add noise, but our current correction is noise-free but it's not perfect, so a bit of scatter remains. So we make systematic errors, and unfortunately, they're different in every patient. Not so for them. 